Well, with that, welcome to the official kickoff of Live Big 2024. And uh, I tell you what, one of the great things about Live Big is that you know, if you kind of watch that video, you will see very quickly that this is a time of great impact for us uh, as individuals, as families, and as a church as well. And if you're new or you can consider yourself a Jesus follower, you have picked a perfect time to be here. What is Live Big? Live Big is when we take a, a about three or four week time, pan, time frame and we challenge our entire church. Kids and students go through this as well. And we challenge them to a season of generosity and all of it, 100%, goes to help those in need. Financially, all of it goes to help those in need. The time that we challenge you to serve, all of it goes to help those in need. And as I've watched that video, I, I kept thinking about, man, what are gonna be the, the add-ons, the new stories that are gonna be a part of just what God has been doing through Live Big over, over the last 10 years? Now, before we dig into Live Big, I just want to uh, just give you guys an update on something that's really cool that's happening in our church right now. Uh, today, uh, actually, uh, they just got done. Uh, our Oak Creek Franklin campus just celebrated their second birthday. And uh, how cool is that? And, and what's great about it is uh, today they're announcing on their second birthday that they are going to from one service to two services. Uh, in 2025. And so just some really cool stuff happening there as a church as we see God just continue to move. Now, I want to ask you a question, and I want a show of hands on this one. How many of you have things in your life that you know you should do, but the bottom line is you just don't want to do it? Just kind of raise your hand. Show, show of hands. Yeah. And if you didn't raise your hand, you just admitted to one. <laughs> Truth telling. <laughs> Truth telling. Now, every time I go to the dentist, one of those gets exposed. Every time I'm there and, and you know, the hygienist is, is doing what the hygienist does and, you know, they're cleaning your teeth and, you know, scraping all the stuff out of there and all that stuff, uh, which nobody likes, uh, it gets done. And then the hygienist will always ask me this question, how many times do you floss a week? <laughs> and every time the question is asked, it's like a spiritual battle for me, you know, how am I going to answer it? I'm like, okay, well, listen, I got two options. If I say three or four times a month, I know what the hygienist is gonna say. They're gonna say, oh, you know, you gotta do it more because you're gonna get uh, gum disease and more plaque and all that stuff. But if I say three or four times a week, the hygienist is gonna go, it's not perfect. I want you to do it seven times a week, but you know, at least you're trying and I can feel good about myself when I leave there and, and all that good stuff. And so I get asked, I pause for a while, and then I go three or four times a week, even though it is really three or four times a month. Now. I know what some of you are doing. You're judging me right now. You're going, you're a pastor and you're lying. Here's the thing, here's the thing. Here, you just listen to me, listen to me. Here's the thing. I think there is more lying that goes on in the dentist's office than I think than anywhere else in our life. You know that? And so you do, but here's the thing. I know I should floss more, but the bottom line is I don't really want to. And as we move into live big in the 10th year, and I've seen this over just the past couple of years, is that the more I talk to people about, about Live Big and who have done it before, whether it be one time or many times, I get one of two primary reactions. You know, one of, one of the reactions is, is, is like in that, they watch that video and, and they're like, oh man, I can't wait for Live Big this year. I can't wait until we give and serve and the impact that we're gonna make and the thousands of people and all that stuff. Man, I can't wait. But then there's this other reaction. And the other reaction is, I know I should be excited, I know I should, I know I should, I know I should, Ugh. but I don't really want to. In fact, in your mind, you're, you're just thinking, you know what, I'm just, I'm just gonna kind of go minimal with Live Big or I'm gonna check out all together and I'll be back when the Christmas series starts. But do you know why Live Big is so important? There are two things, primarily, that we see that really matter to God, besides his church, which he calls his bride. One is what he calls the lost. And the lost is a term that Jesus used to describe anyone who is disconnected from God in any way. It's why he came, to rescue us who are lost. But then there's a second thing that we know that's important. It's another term Jesus used, the least of these. The least of these are the widows and the orphans, the vulnerable, the outcasts, the poor, those in need. Both of those are, are very important to Jesus. That's why we talk about them so much. And Live Big, and this is what's great about Live Big, our total focus of Live Big is on the least of these because this right here is the very heartbeat of our Heavenly Father. Now, while that should be enough to move us and go like, okay, we're ready to go, there's actually more, and this more is something that we don't think about. 
You see, when we engage with something like Live Big, this allows us to focus on something that we don't often focus on because we miss it altogether, our own story. You know, one of the reasons why we wanna lift people out of poverty and we wanna provide opportunities for people because this is our story. You see, because our Heavenly Father lifted every single one of us out of our spiritual poverty. You see, God wants to alleviate human suffering. And, and the reason is, is because most human suffering is caused by sin. Not all of it, but most of it is, whether it be individual sin or societal sin. Now, you might hear that and go, well, Mark, that's not my fault. It's not my problem. And you know what? You are exactly right. But as a Jesus follower, we should never use the word fault. Instead, we talk about responsibility. Why is that? Because that's our story. That God sent his son because we have a sin problem. And he came and he didn't go, well, that's not my fault. That's their fault. Not my problem. Rather, he looked at every single one of us and he said, I'm going to take responsibility for something that's not my fault. And it was fueled by love. And so as we go into Live Big, the 10th year, if you've done Live Big before, and maybe you're feeling that second group that I talked about, maybe you're apathetic about it, you're indifferent, you're like, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. And that's how your heart is feeling towards it. Let that be the check engine light of your heart. And let it function in that way because your heart is not where it needs to be because your heart is not where God's heart is. And not only that, there's a disconnect you are experiencing right now between the reality and understanding of your spiritual story and the reality of other people's life story. And so I wanna be upfront. I want this to be our biggest and best live big we've ever had as far as engagement is concerned. Because how we engage reveals how aligned our heart is with our Heavenly Father. Now, today what I want to do is there, there's three components of Live Big. There's a give piece, there's a serve piece, and there's a love piece. Today, I want to kick it off as we usually do with the give piece. And by the give piece, I mean financially give. And so I'm going to be upfront. I'm going to challenge our church again. And so here's what I need you to do. If you don't have them on already, I want you to put on your big boy pants or your big girl pants, or maybe you've got Live Big swag on already. Okay, that counts as big boy or big girl pants, okay? That counts, but I want you to put them on because we're gonna be challenged. And uh, we're not gonna be challenged by me. You're gonna see, but we're gonna be challenged by the Apostle Paul. But here's the thing about challenge. We don't grow without being challenged. Plus, the history of our church has always been to rise to the challenge, and I believe that we're gonna do it again this year. Now, we're going to look at something that the Apostle Paul talked about in regards to money that at first, like flossing for me, we know we should do it, but we don't really want to do it. And I'm going to give you what Paul's going to say up front, and then I'm going to back out of it, and we're going to talk about why Paul said that. And here, here's what Paul is going to tell us up front. The smartest way to live is to give. Not the best way, even though Jesus said it's better to give than to receive, Paul is about to tell us why it is the smartest way to live. And so we're going to look at a couple of verses that Paul wrote in 1 Timothy. Here's what Paul says. He says, I want you to command those who are rich in this present world. And most of us, we look at that and we're like, glad he's not talking to me because I'm not rich. And the reason why you don't think you're rich is because for almost all of us, we don't feel rich. Now, what's, what's important about that is you never want to attach, we don't want to attach, uh, rich and feelings. And the, re and the reason why that is, is because if we attach those two, then all of us have only felt rich probably one time in our life. And you know what that is? Our first paycheck. I can still remember... Uh, I worked at this place called Cops. It was a grocery store. <clears throat> and uh, I got this job at this grocery store. I had to come in at 4.30 in the morning and I had to unload the produce trucks when they came in, okay? Because I was a healthy guy back then. And so I was unloading the produce, unloading the produce, unloading the produce. And so I can still remember getting my first paycheck. And I, and I get this paycheck and it was like $120. And I was like, I can buy whatever I want. This is amazing. And then uh, uh, tw the twins, our twin boys, Josh and Caleb, they got their first job at Culver's. I mean, I'm unloading fruits and veggies and they're making custard, okay? They had a better, better deal on their side. And they got their first paycheck. I remember they just came into the door and they're like, dad, look at this. And they're showing me their paycheck. And they're like, 
were loaded and they were just so excited here's what i said to them <laughs> enjoy it because you'll never feel like that ever again after this i'm gonna tell you right now and you know isn't that just true and the reason why most of us don't feel rich and there's a lot of reasons but i think the primary reason is because we see what everybody else has and we see what they drive and we see what they wear. And then there's Instagram and we look at Instagram and we're like, oh, they look so much better and their kids look so much better. And then we, and we think to ourselves, oh man, my life stinks. And you know, I, why can't I have more? But here's the reality. In worldwide standards, okay? And this is how we gotta see things. We know we kinda see things right in front of us, but from a worldwide perspective, if you, if you your household individually or together, okay, if your household income is $36,000, okay? Check this out, this is awesome. You're gonna love this, okay? Check this out. If your household income is $36,000, you are in the top 1% of wage earners in the world. What, no one's excited about that? Every time I say that, no one goes, hoo hoo, honey, we're in the one percenter, baby. Look at us, we're that, wow, we are rich. No one ever says that every time I throw that out there. And you know why? Because we don't feel rich. But there are tens of millions of, hundreds of millions of people who look at you and look at me and they look at us and go, you and I are filthy rich. So Paul is talking to us. And then he says this, he says, command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant. Well, how can we be arrogant with our money? H how do we do that? Well, Paul was referring to something that Jesus said, or was alluding to it, that is true of every single one of us. And that is, God owns everything. We don't own anything. Our money and stuff, we don't own it. We're actually stewards or managers of everything God has entrusted to us. Now, the main way our arrogance is exposed is through this little thing called greed. Now, here's a definition of greed. Greed is just the belief that everything you have is for you. Now, there are two problems that, that we run into every time we talk about greed. He, here's the first problem. Nobody believes they're greedy. Nobody does. If I said, okay, everybody, show of hands, if you're greedy, it'd be like. And here's, here's the reason why. We're blind to greed. I've never been to at a funeral where someone went, oh, you know what I loved about her? She was so greedy. She was so greedy. It's always like, you know, they're generous and, and all that stuff. So we are blind. We all think that we're generous. And here's the second problem. The second problem is, is that greedy people at the core, okay? They wouldn't say this publicly or anything like that. At the core, believe they are the owner. That they are not stewards, they are the owner. And here's where the arrogance of that comes in. When we believe we're the owner, we look at God who has given us every gift and ability and opportunity that we have. We look at the God who allowed us to be born in the country that we are born in. We look at the God who sent his son so we could have forgiveness of sin and experience life with him. We look at the one who, as we look at our life in general, we've had very little control over the things that happened to us. Most of it is by the very grace of God. And we look at that God and we go, you know what? It is all mine. I will do with it whatever I want to. You know, it's why you've never met a happy, greedy person before. It's because when we think it's ours, we live with our fists like this, and there is no peace and happiness in this. And then Paul's like, okay, I don't want you just to be, no, don't be arrogant. He says, I also, I don't want you to put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. You see, money makes, money and stuff makes us, every single one of us, a promise. And here is the promise. If you love and trust me, then you'll be satisfied. And I'll bring you that satisfaction. And I'll bring you contentment. And I'll bring you security. And I will bring you hope. But here's what we know. We know that is not true. I mean, you think about this. You think about that first car, not like the first car you got, because most of us, you know, it was like a, a bad car and all that stuff. But think about the first car you got that you were like, oh man, I like this car. I like this car. Oh man, I don't, I'd be fine if I could drive this for the rest of my life. I mean, I love the smell of it, the color, all this stuff. Okay, you think about that. How long until all of a sudden there's French fries on the floor and there's junk all over the place, you know, and you didn't care about it, didn't care about it anymore. Then you were like, oh man, I just, I need a different car and then that'll be enough. We see this with clothes, all right? You know, some of you, you've done this, okay? Maybe I've done it. Uh, some of you, you, you've looked in the mirror and you've just looked at yourself and you're like, I cannot go out in public looking like this. 
And then you started, you know, with disgust, taking off your clothes. And you're like, get off of me, Satan. You know, you're throwing off the clothes and all that stuff. And then you put on the new clothes and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is it. And here's the thing, you did that with the prior set of clothes. I mean, we do this. We say, hey, if I just said this, 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 then I would be satisfied, then I would be okay. Here's the reality. Money and stuff don't satisfy us. They can't lead us to a place of contentment. Instead, they actually lead us to a place where we worry and we want more. I mean, think about the worry side of it for a minute. What in your life have you worried about more than money? Either it be having enough or wanting more. Probably not a whole lot. And you also think about this. The more we have, the more we tend to worry. And then it, we, we want more. Because stuff and money is like an appetite. You have to keep feeding it and feeding it and feeding it for it to be satisfied. And so money and stuff makes us a promise, but it actually delivers the opposite. I love how Joby Martin, who's a pastor in Florida, I love how he sums this up. He says this, when we spend it all on us, it leads to a house full of junk, a heart full of regret, and a head full of questions. And the question is primarily, is this it? Is this it? Is this it? Well, Paul gives us kind of all, all, the, all the tough stuff up front. And then what I love about what Paul does, he shifts gears. And he's going to give us now, okay, if this is what you don't want to do, let me tell you what you want to do. And he gives us the contrast. And he, and he says this. He says, don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides. In other words, he's like, hey, don't, don't put all, 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 your, all your identity and all your contentment in something that constantly changes and you gotta chase it and you can never catch it. Rather, put it in the owner who is the only stable one in your life. And then he makes this statement, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Everything. Does everything include money? Yes. Some of you may be like, well, I've been told like, you know, money's bad and evil and stuff's bad and evil and all that stuff. Not at all, not at all. Now, some of you, you, you hear that and it's like, money for my enjoyment. <laughs> I enjoy it all the time. I love just spending it and spending it and shop, shop, shop and getting things and all that stuff, you know, and all that stuff. You know, that's not what I'm talking about is for enjoyment. What, I'm, what Paul's talking about when he says enjoyment, he says that when you view money and when you see money and your experience of money is one of peace, and it's a fulfillment, it lacks worry, and it's open-handedness. In other words, Paul's saying, when we understand the purpose of our money, we will enjoy our money. You know, for most of us, when we, we think about money, we think the purpose of our money is to just fuel our lifestyle and our dreams and our goals. For others of us, we've had this experience with money, there's just a lot of guilt attached to it, and it's been like, I know I should give more, but I don't. I know I should do this more, but I don't. For others of us, when we talk about money, you get mad. And you're just like, don't you talk about money, I'm never coming back to this church, because we're talking about money, and you're grumpy about the whole thing and, and all that stuff, and you're kind of clenching up, you got your wallet, make sure it's still there, you know, because someone take it on the way in. Now here's what you need to know, those reactions are your reactions because you don't understand God's purpose for money. See, here's what the New Testament talks about time and time again when it comes to money. Money is just a tool given to us by God. And it's a tool that is to be used to provide for our family. That is really important. And I'm not minimizing that. Please hear me on that. But there's more to that tool. It's also something that God provides us to accomplish his purpose and purposes through us. And when we begin to understand that holistically, we will begin to enjoy our money in a way that we never thought we could enjoy our money because now we are using it for the purpose it was intended to be used. And then Paul continues, he says, he says, all right, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. That's Paul's way of saying, okay, when you see a need, don't just write out a check all the time and go, here you go, and throw money at it and throw money at it and throw money at it. And he goes, that's important, and there's a time to do that. But every once in a while, I want you to step in and get into the trenches. I want you to not just give of your finances, I want you to take times to give of yourself. And then he says, and then to be generous and willing to share. 
Now, generosity in, in, in our culture and all that, a lot of times generosity people, well, I'm, genero I'm generous with my time, I'm generous with my time, generous with my time. Here's the thing, in the Bible, generosity and time are never connected with each other. And what I've noticed, and this is kind of, this is kind of challenging, for many of us who say, but I'm generous with my time, that's code for, I don't wanna be generous with my money. But every time it's talked about in the Bible, generosity refers to our money. Now, if I was to ask you, hey, are you generous? Are you generous? Once again, if you go back to the greed thing, people will go like, yeah, man, I'm generous, I'm generous. I mean, I tip 20% and uh, I, I've given to this and I've given to that. But here's what's interesting. The average American gives about 2% of their income away. I was trying to just think of something that would just kind of give some perspective for that. If I had 100 pennies on this table, and uh, they'd probably take about this about half of the table, 100 pennies here, and then I took two pennies out, would you go, man, you're giving a lot? I think the answer would be no. Now, let me just push on us a bit. And it's going to feel for many of you, and this is where the tension and the conflict, and maybe some of you are like, what, what planet are you living on, Mark, and all stuff? And the reason why you're going to feel that is because culture's view of generosity, which is what we view through a lot of us, and our Heavenly Father's view of generosity are very different. And the way I'm going to challenge you with that is by asking you a question that a mentor of mine challenged me years ago, who, when this was challenged to me, I thought this person was nuts at first. But I'm going to challenge you because this question was a game changer for me. And here's the question, here's the question. When it comes to your outflow of money, I mean, just all the money that goes out, when you, when you think about uh, uh, bills and entertainment and savings and uh, spend, anything that you spend, retirement, all that stuff, when you just think about all that, how much of that outflow of money goes towards giving? And the reality is, for most of us, it is way down here on the list. But if you follow Jesus, and one of the litmus tests that you know you're going in your faith is that bottom, when it comes to generosity, it begins to go up and up and up and up because that means your heart is aligning with God's heart. And because he is generous, we become more generous. Now, as I said, this question was challenged to me years ago, and I didn't care for the question, like some of you probably don't care for the question either. And I didn't like it at first because here was the core of the question. The core of the question is, when are you gonna let giving drive your spending and savings, not spending and savings drive your giving, like most of us do? And I remember just being challenged with that and going like, that's the way it should be. And uh, so Don and I, years ago, we, uh, we, we made this decision. We felt like we were really convicted by God to do this. We said, that's where we wanna be. And we're nowhere near that at this point. And we struggled with money and all that stuff. So here, here's what we did. We made a long-term goal where we said, we want to get to a place where our outflow, our largest outflow, is our giving. And so we've tried to take steps over the years, and this has been very difficult for us to do because we see what everybody else is doing. They're like, they're going to Disneyland. Well, honey, we're going to Bay Beach, you know, where there's a dime for a ride. You know, and we see some of that stuff. And at first, you know, it's like, well, everybody, and so we should, and you know, it's, it's like the cycle you get into and all that stuff. But we just said, no, no, we're, we're gonna do this. And uh, we're, we're not there yet, but we are very close. And here's what we discovered, and, and you would discover this as well. We spend less, we save more, and we give more, and we are having more fun because of it. Because generosity is a fun thing. And I'm telling you, when you do that, you will as well. And we are experiencing God bless our lives in some really cool ways. Well, Paul then wraps it up by giving us the why giving is the smartest way to live. And he just gives us such great perspective of this. Here's what Paul writes. He says, in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so they may take hold of the life that is truly life. And so Paul goes, hey, I just want to remind you of something. There is more to life than just this life. That there is a next life and what you do, especially when it comes to your resources that God has entrusted to you, is going to affect or impact your experience in the next life. You see, Paul is saying, I want to remind you, you and I were made for the eternal, that we should see things from that, that perspective. This is why the temporary will never satisfy us. Now, once again, show of hands, how many of you have ever been to a Greyhound track? How many? How many have been to a Greyhound track? You sinners, gambling and stuff. Now, if let's just say I was told this by a friend who goes on a Greyhound track that uh, there's a dog 
and there's dogs that chase something that's not real. Chases a rabbit. And this rabbit even has a name. Does anyone know what the name of the rabbit is? Man, no one gets it right. Okay. Rusty. Rusty. The, ra the rabbit's name is Rusty. And so here's what you have at a greyhound track. They put all these dogs in a kennel. And these dogs, man, they just, they're dying to get out of there, man, because they are born to run, you know? All of a sudden, the announcer goes, here's Rusty. And all of a sudden, boom, and the dogs go flying out of there, you know? And they're bobbing their head like this, you know, because they're running, they're bumping into each other, and they're bobbing, 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 bobbing. And all of a sudden, the rabbit disappears, and then the dogs disappear, and all of a sudden, they just stop. They just stop, because the rabbit's gone, you know? And I've often wondered, what are, they, what are they thinking about when they stop? You know, what are they doing there? And I can imagine them having the conversation. Like one dog will go like, oh, I almost had him this time. Almost had him. And then one going like, yeah, me too, me too. Do you think we're going to get another shot at him? I don't know. We, this may have been our last chance. And then here's what's interesting. The next day, they do it again. And here's the thing. They do that nearly every day of our life. In fact, we kind of look at them because they're chasing something they can't catch. We go, <laughs> what a dumb dog. You know, what a dumb dog. And just a you know, side note, cats don't do this, okay? They're much smarter than dogs are when it comes to it. Now, here's the thing. Every Monday for many of us, our alarm goes, here's Rusty. And we jump out and we go, oh, granite countertops. Are you kidding? I can get granite countertops. We think, hey, half bath. Oh, I can get an extra half bath. Oh, I can get it in leather. Oh, I can't wait to get that thing in leather. Oh, the truck has 30,000 miles. That's too much. I need to get a new truck because it's got too, much, too many miles on it. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in stores. I've been in stores. I'm like, I didn't know I needed that. But man, I really need that because it's calling out to me. It's like the voice of God is doing something in there, you know? And see, here's the thing about dogs. The dogs chase something that they never catch. But for many of us, we chase something and we catch it. Maybe that thing, stuff, image, position, whatever it may be, and we catch it and it lets us down and here's what we do. We just reshape it in our mind again and we keep chasing after it. Why? Because the temporary never fulfill us because it was never meant to. And so Paul says, and this is just brilliant, Paul says, instead of chasing after stuff that doesn't satisfy you because it is temporary, chase after things that will last. And he says, when we get to a place where we open up our hands and we start to become more generous to kingdom-minded things in this world, which are the things that will last, Paul says, here's what happened. You'll experience the life that is truly life. What is he saying? You'll start to experience, this is what I was built for. This is what this was meant for. And so what Paul says is very challenging, but he's right. The smartest way to live is to give because someday every single one of us is going to pass and we're going to stand before as stewards. We are going to stand before the owner and give account of how we manage his resources. So before we get there, let's start giving while the given's good and live big is an opportunity for us to do that. Now, keeping that all in mind, if you're new with us, here's what we do for live big. And this is awesome. Our church goes around some, some nonprofits that we have vetted that deal with uh, pro poverty cycles and kids and families and churches. And our strategy has always been come alongside of them and go, hey, what do you need that can help you go further faster? And then they give us a list of specific things and we compile that wish list in, into what we call a big wish list. And that wish list consists of hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of things. And then as a part of Live Big, Man, we just do whatever we can over, over these three or four weeks and we see how many of those needs that, that we can meet. And as I said, this is 10 years. I, I was just kind of reflecting on some of the things in 10 years. Uh, our church, this is so cool. Our church has given away over $1.5 million. And uh, we, when we started Live Big, we weren't going, we're going to do this every year, you know, because it started at like ten dollars or $15,000. Like, oh, okay, that's great. And it just, over the last few years, man, it just the heart of this place has taken off. And uh, we have provided food and clothing for tens of thousands of families, many of them right here in our own community. And uh, we have provided with, with great organizations. We have helped them hire staff, uh, do expansion programs, uh, buy them much needed supplies so they could help more people in need. And not only that, but we dial it up as you're gonna see, and we've had tens of thousands of people serve tens of thousands of hours to help those in need. And as we kick it off this year, as we kick it off with the big, with, with the give part, 
I just want to challenge our church. In the past, I always set a number and go, let this number be your reference point for per person giving. In a couple years, we said, "Uh uh-uh, we're not doing that. We're not lowering the bar. We are raising the bar. And we said, we want every single person to get to a place where they just go, okay, God, how do you want us to sacrificially give so we can help more people in need? And for some of you, you're like, I'd love to, but that means I would have to like stop going to Starbucks for, you know, a, a month and I've stopped getting daily Amazon deliveries and all that stuff. And listen, if that's you, that's okay. That's okay. That's what it means to say no to you so you can say yes to something that's near and dear to God's heart, which will move your heart. But for others of us, and most of us, we're doing good. And so what does it look like for you to challenge yourself and your family during this season? And maybe for you, that's $500, $1,000, $5,000, $50,000, maybe even $100,000. So here's how you can give. On your seat, there is a card, a LiveBig card with a QR code. There's also one on the screen here. And uh, if, you, if you go on to this QR code, scan this QR code, everything live big is there. The wish list, everything. You'll see it's an aggressive wish list. In fact, here's two really cool things. We do this thing called Winter Wonder Fest that many of you know about where we, we serve almost 2,000 kids that are living below the poverty line right here in our surrounding community. Well, this year, because of our partnerships with the school district, we're not just doing one Winter Wonder Fest this year. Oak Creek Franklin turned two, and so they're gonna have their own Winter Wonder Fest. So we're doing two Winter Wonder Fests this year. And not only that, yeah, not only that, but because of our partnership with the school district, we're gonna buy over 1,500 kids, hats, gloves, and coats for the winter that would not normally have them as it gets really cold outside. And so I want you to scan this QR code. The giving portal opens now. Uh, if you give digitally, it's LiveBig2024. Uh, and you, like I said, you can give anytime you want to that. If, you, if you're a check person, some of you are like, what is this check thing you're talking about? It's a piece of paper that you actually write things out. Uh, but you, you will write that and put Live Big in the memo and uh, that'll go towards the Live Big, uh, live big total. Uh, my wife and I's tradition has been to be the first gift every year. And in the past, two sneaky families have tried to to uh, get around me, but we blocked you this year. And so my wife and I were the first ones and you guys suck and you're not gonna give any more for us. It's us first, okay? And uh, we love that, man. We just love that and just love that. And so we're all in, we're pumped about it. And here's the thing, uh, it's easy for, for us to kind of, well, I've been there, been there, been there. No, new year, new opportunity, okay? And our church has grown by 15%. For some of you, you need to jump in and go, okay, this is where I'm really, really going to place my feet. I'm a part of what God is doing here. And I need to say this as well. I need to say this every year. For some of you, you take your normal giving and you transfer it to live big. Listen, that's not living big. In fact, it's the opposite of living big. It's hurting one at the expense of the other. Live big is about blessing both. And so we're, we have a great series plan. Next week, we got a really cool experience that you're, you're gonna wanna be a part of. And uh, you're gonna hear some great stories of impact with people. And I say people because behind that wish list is real people with real needs who if you work with people who are caught in poverty cycles, every day they get up and they can't look to the next day. Because every day it's right here in the moment, that's all they have and they go, if only, if only, if only, if only. And there's a sense of hopelessness with them. We have the opportunity with tens of thousands of people right around here to break that, break that cycle and provide hope for them. And so these are real people. So why would we not want to go, God, it's yours anyways, and it's the smartest way to live, and then we give in a way that points people to God. And listen, you don't got to be afraid of that because it's the smartest way to, to live. Let me pray for us. Father, um, as we move into this next season, um, first off, we celebrate the past, God. You've done just some really cool stuff, but we turn the page and we go, God, what's next? We are not satisfied. Um, as we just kind of talk about what does it look like for us to open our hands and God, it's all yours anyways. What do you want to do? And uh, I pray you would really move hearts. And uh, this would really be that a spirit of generosity would just continue to break out in this place. And it's not generosity for generosity's sake. It's generosity to tap into your heart because we're tapping into your heart for the least of these, which we know, God, just runs deep with you. And if it runs deep with you, we want it to run deep with us. And so, Father, um, may you multiply our efforts. Uh, God, uh, I I pray for this Live Big that you would double what's been done in the last nine years. And um, we would see just you do some amazing things here, not just for the people that are in need, that matters, but in our hearts as well. Because, God, they both, they both go hand in hand.
So Father, I thank you for our church and our church's willingness to go, yeah, man, let's go, let's go. God, let's go. And we pray this all in Jesus' name, amen.